In your travels, you may have heard that K-SKU CPUs that endure additional voltage throughout their life will die quicker because of transistor evaporation. And I'm quoting engineers on that, so just bear with me. Has anybody actually tested and proven this? Not necessarily. Now, I am most certainly not in a position to do that today in a purely empirical scientific manner, but I do come across a lot of used hardware, so I'm in a unique position to actually gather all this shit up and play with it. And that's what we're going to do today. I, over the last three months, gathered a grand total of 10 i5-2500Ks and attempted to overclock each of them as best I could at various voltages to see just how far they would go compared to how they used to go back when they were released. Shh. So needless to say, it's been an arduous journey full of Prime 95 uh, stress testing and a lot of swapping out CPUs and letting motherboards idle for a long period of time. But we are finally done. This is the last CPU in that batch, the last i5-2500K that I labeled Sample 10 in testing. And it's the last one that I have yet to sell in either a client build or to a person individually at a price of my choosing. Now, let's talk about testing methodology first before we get into the numbers. <music> Now, number one, we didn't go for extreme overclocks because, frankly, I didn't want to risk the chips dying because of me being a fucking dumbass. I limited myself to a hard 1.35 volts across all the tests that I did, and we'll talk more about that later. We employed the same motherboard for all tests. It was just a simple, basic P8Z68-VLX motherboard from Asus. It was actually a budget Z series board back in the day. It's perfectly fine. Not exactly the best VRM design, but that shouldn't be a limiting factor considering we're not going for those massive of water-cooled OCs. Memory speeds were fixed, disabled all that power-saving nonsense, used manual fixed voltage only, no offsets, and we tested each CPU for stability with a one-hour small FFT Prime 95 run, which I know is not how you would test in real life. You would certainly let it go for like a day or two if you were really diligent, uh, but we're just trying to get a good idea of where these CPUs fall, testing at various uh, clock speeds and voltages, so I figured that was just about enough. Now back in the day, one 1.35 volts would more or less get you between 4.6 to 4.9 gigahertz depending on how lucky you got but most people were between 4.7 and 4.8 and that's where our testing began we started there just to see if we could just set and forget at that speed and see how it turned out and as it turns out none of them passed what we did after that was knock the clocks down by 100 megahertz at a time until each sample was stable and recorded the clock speed we achieved at that voltage we then repeated that for a second second and third series of tests at 1.3 and 1.25 volts. 1.25 volts was included because that's more or less the voltage you can leave the CPU at and still run it on a stock cooler, believe it or not. People back in the day were doing 4.3, 4.4, on just that piece of shit that came in the box. And we wanted to see just how well we could do with those power circumstances here in 2017. Anyhow, enough blab, and let's look at the first series of results in slide form. <music> Okay, so here we have 1.35 volts across all 10 samples, and sample 6 was the clear winner at 4.6 gigahertz with an average core max temperature of 82 degrees. Don't read too deeply into the temperature readings. They were done with an Enermax ETS N30, which is a 92 millimeter tower cooler which means it's significantly worse than a Hyper 212, but about the same as a TX3, just to give you some basis for comparison. Those are perfectly reasonable temperatures given the voltage applied and the clocks achieved, and we had three samples, 5, 7, and 8, bringing up the rear at 4.4 GHz. Still not terrible for a very tolerable voltage. Dropping down 50 millivolts to 1.3, we have sample 6 at 4.5 GHz this time. Still very impressive given its age. 77 degrees on the hot core same cooler was employed this time so a little bit more acceptable temperatures for most people a lot of people don't really like to pass that 80 threshold gets them a little bit too close to that 95 to 100 throttling range sample 5 proving to be the big loser of the bunch once again 4.1 gigahertz on 1.3 volts that is a beaten up chip right there but certainly not indicative of the average looks like most of them got between 4.2 and 4.3 and once again let's drop it down another 50 millivolts and see what kind of results we we get this time on the stock cooler. I will add that both with the Enermax ETS N30 and the stock cooler, I didn't bother fixing fan speeds. This is not meant to be a temperature test, just sort of meant to demonstrate to you that you can sort of achieve acceptable temperatures if you just let the system do its thing. And as you can see here from the results, 
Everything's perfectly fine. We're in the mid 80s across the board, across all different samples. Once again, sample five bringing up the rear at 3.9 gigahertz and sample six shining through at 4.3 on 1.25 volts and the stock cooler which is nuts that's that's pretty much as good as a locked i5 is these days by comparison something like an i5 7400 probably going to be about the same performance range and all for the low low price of a shitty cooler uh, six year old processor and motherboard but of course what i consider to be the biggest win in this series of tests is that nine out of ten samples went over four gigahertz at 1.25 volts with perfectly acceptable temperatures on the stock cooler with default fan settings, which is very encouraging for anyone just looking to throw together a build and not think too much. But of course, none of that boring shit matters unless you have some sort of historical context. What did these processors go through? What was their life like before they reached my desk? And so forth. And while I don't have a history on all of them, I do in fact have a history on the key samples included in this test. First, let's take a look at sample six, which was the golden boy of the bunch during testing. Now sample six is special because it came to me however many years ago after it was purchased new by somebody who brought it to me to put it together for them for a small fee, which I do on a fairly regular basis. He recently decided to upgrade, so naturally he called me back and said, hey, I'll give you a lot of this stuff in exchange for your services and putting together a new computer. So that is currently ongoing. Anyhow, I got the old stuff back and that gave me an opportunity to play with it. Now this gentleman is a perfectly bright guy. He fully understands that overclocking is a thing and that it's perfectly easy and good, but he's so timid and uh, never wanted any part of it. So when I offered to overclock it for him upon building it, he said no. He would rather just deal with it when he had to. So fast forward to, I guess, what was about a year ago as of today and he messages me and says hey if uh, my, my system is a little slow I think it's the CPU the resource monitor tells me so my graphics card doesn't seem to be sweating too hard in a few games is there anything we can do about that and I said yes you can finally overclock the CPU you were putting off and he said yeah I'd rather not ruin it maybe I can get something for it I would prefer to just buy a new system altogether so that's what he decided to do. And of course, in exchange for putting together his new one, I got the old stuff. As such, that i5-2500K, sample six in our testing, was never overclocked for the entire duration of its life, not even once. Now, does that necessarily mean that not overclocking your CPU is going to preserve its overclockability later? Well, that's certainly possible and no one's denying that. Keep in mind that this test is not, strictly speaking, scientific. There are a lot of controls that would need to be implemented in order for it to be so, and we need a much larger sample size to make that sort of determination, but still interesting nonetheless. Let's move to our worst sample, sample five, which was the shittiest of the bunch and by a lot. Sample five came from a guy who had a very different background. He was fully willing to overclock his chip, but he wanted to get the most life and performance that he possibly could out of it because he didn't necessarily have a lot of money and he wanted it to last him for a long time. And that it did. It certainly served him well over the course of the five years or so that he had it. Now he also happened to luck into a donor cooler that allowed him to overclock this thing to shit. He pushed it all the way up to 1.425 volts for its entire life under a thermal right cooler of some kind. It's one of the double tower ones with the two fans. It's kind of like the NHD14 and D15, but thermal right's a version of it. Long story short, big ass cooler, kept it relatively cool throughout its entire life at 4.9 gigahertz. And to see it degrade so severely is definitely very telling. If this were a scientific study, which it's really not, but still interesting nonetheless to look at. And so definitely some numbers that can be added to a larger data set if such a thing ever arises and people want to agglomerate all of this data together and make one long ass boring video about it. <music> So, in conclusion, if this video is meant to serve any purpose, and I think it does to a degree, uh, and keep in mind, once again, I will restate, I am not a science guy, but if you're going to pull any information out of this and understand that it is still purely, largely baseless conjecture, what you can assume, at the very least, is that i5-2500K uh, chips, in general, will still overclock reasonably well to give you sort of modern locked i5 level performance, which is sort of what most people are aiming for when they buy a budget chip like that and also what we can kind of surmise or at least have an inkling of an indication to of a sur surmise is that the life of a chip and the amount of stress it endures during its life does indeed have an impact on how it will perform and how it will overclock in later years so when engineers tell you it's like well hey everything might be fine with your little overclock there just understand that the reason we recommend against it because it does reduce the lifespan of your blah 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 turns out 
maybe they have a point. Uh, anyway, I think we're going to call it a video. Like, subscribe, uh, comment, uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, check me out on uh, YouPorn. Tell me what color shirt you think I should wear next. And I'll see you again in the next video.